this is going to be a treat, and Shimon, thanks for making the time to spend it with us today. Um, happy holidays. Thanks. Happy holidays. Christmas comes. Um, so I've had the pleasure. Make yourself comfortable. Yeah, make yourself comfortable. It's a fireside chat. Um, I've had the pleasure of uh, having a public conversation with Chamath a few times, and I try the technique every time where I, you know, I'll sort of ping him in advance, hey, do you want to talk about something? Each time I'll say, no, let's just go. And so I actually created a little list of things, so I'll let you, Chamath, pick. You should talk about hard things. What we're going to talk about first. I got six topics. You choose first. Election fake news, globalization, trade, and immigration, the role of Silicon Valley, filter bubbling, tech news, Twitter, etc., sports and athletes. Well, I feel like one, two, four, and five are the same question. <laughs> Here, I'll start off with the more specific. These are shitty topics, these are not hard. <laughs> okay, let's start out with um, so. I, I listened to your podcast about the election in, a, in as dispassionate view as you can, which I know is hard. Um, is the election good or bad or neutral for Silicon Valley and tech? Um, I think it, it's a multifaceted answer. I think in, um, well, I think broad-based, I would say it's actually quite good. It's probably the, the best thing that probably could have happened to us for the following reason, which is that there's a type of conversation that I think that's happening now um, that probably wouldn't have happened if Hillary had won. And, uh, and part of it, I think, centers around this idea that we have cocooned ourselves into this nice, beautiful little existence that's frankly just detached from reality. Um, and then separately, we were never forced to really understand the scope of the problems that we should have been working on. The real implication of that is I think you're going to see this probably in two or three years where when the capital cycle starts to change, um, there's just been so many really poorly constructed businesses and business models that are going to be under pressure. So I think all of those conversations can now happen because of the other. So in many ways, I think it's probably like the most um, useful thing that could have happened. Um, at a more moral and ethical level for a lot of people, I think it creates a lot of doubt and fear, um, and that's unfortunate. Um, but I think the net balances uh, can be positive if you look at it. And, and what do you think the new, what's your view on the new administration's relationship either with Silicon Valley or the technology industry in general? And is there a role for the Valley practically to play? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 look, I mean, I think if you look at the president-elect's tax plan, I mean, it's nothing but good news. Um, if you actually are somebody, well, let me actually take a step back and I can talk about sort of the world as I see it. My, my big kind of like clarifying moment has happened sort of in the last few months along the following dimension. Uh, you know, we do these really intensive portfolio reviews inside, inside social capital where we go very deep inside of our companies. And part of that was because over the last five years, we took a lot of these capabilities that we had at Facebook, which is where I and a bunch of my partners come from, and we built it into frameworks, and at first we were worried that those only apply to Facebook. All the things we did in machine learning, all the things we did in data science, um, all the things we did around paid acquisition. But over time we found that they applied to all these companies, we deployed it on those companies that we work with, companies like Slack and Intercom, companies you know. And we collect these artifacts, and now these artifacts have been building up over years, okay? Incrementally what we did was, we, this is a long way to answer, but I'll get there. Incrementally, what we did was we took all those capabilities and we stuck it on the web. We built this thing called the Magic 8-Ball Framework and we said, founders, get your shit together, get your head out of your ass and understand your business. So you come to our website, it's like three or four clicks deep, but the point is, since we put these series of blog posts out, we've had, as of this morning, I looked, 3,400 companies run a Magic 8-Ball. And a magic eight ball is effectively a gap for a startup, right? Generally accepted accounting principles. So if you're a public company, you know, how would you compare, for example, a, health, a public company in healthcare with a public company in oil and gas? Well, there are rules, and it's called gap. And it's how you, you know, basically, you know, report out your earnings, create balance sheets, and it, it allows you to make an apples to apples comparison across industries. Similarly, we felt that that would, that would be possible in startup land. 
Like, what is the difference between an enterprise software company and a consumer network type business? Well, today, the easy answer is everything, they're all different. Our perspective is actually they're all quite similar. You just don't know what to look at. And so we try to create this framework. So long story is we've collected this entire corpus of information. In a quarter, we're going to actually release a benchmarking tool out to founders that will allow you to understand how you measure on these very deep nuanced metrics across thousands of companies. So how are you doing on LTV to cap? Is that important? You get it. How are you doing on fixed month retention? Is that important? Maybe it isn't. What about if you're in the top eight, you know, 90th percentile in a certain category and the bottom fifth in another category? To know that is really powerful because you can now start to fix your business in there. So we're sitting in a portfolio review, and I've been thinking that something is amiss. And what I see is degrading sales efficiency in some of our enterprise SaaS businesses. And this thing clicks. And I go off and I've been thinking about it, and I, and I would come back to the following framework, which is there are really only three kinds of companies that get created in Silicon Valley. Two are valuable, and one is a category of complete dog shit. <coughs> category one is what I would call bits to atoms. So you're building something in software that then gets translated and manifested in the real world, in physical atoms. Right? So what are examples of Let's use scale companies, okay? Amazon is a fantastic bits to atoms company. It started off as completely virtual e-commerce, but now they build more things in the physical world. They're buying boats and planes, they're building robots, they're building fulfillment centers. Tesla, another bits to atoms company. They have fantastic software and capability, but it manifests in batteries and engines and cars. Literally, raw material comes in the front of the gigafactory, Model X has come up from that. Apple for better or worse, you know, translates really great software into a fantastic physical product. SpaceX, and we've done a lot of these bits to atoms companies, and what I'll tell you about these companies is they're fundamentally defensible. Because they are hard, they're not obvious, and most founders don't have the patience or the wherewithal or the sources of capital to actually go build them, and so as a result, they're quite unique. Those businesses, in this new administration will absolutely thrive. Because you're gonna have an administration that is gonna be very pro-United States. And they are going to seek out companies and markets and businesses that basically promote Americans' excellence in things. And if you are building physical things, so for example, we have a company in Los Angeles that is constructing what will be the biggest high precision 3D printer in the world. And we're using it to, to actually print a stage two rocket. So what is like a 65,000 part bill will get reduced to literally two or three parts, which is preposterous, okay? But it's happening. But what I say is like, even if, even if that works or doesn't work, the point is we can create a renaissance in 3D manufacturing in the United States airplanes, fuselages, wings, all kinds of things. Propellers, windmills, you name it. To think that the current administration will not be all over that business is naive, of course they will. So the fact that technology businesses can actually create a renaissance and things that you know can build a stratification of job growth, right? Not just $200,000 software engineers, but all the way up and down the stack is a really powerful concept. That will win. There's another kind of category of business that I think is fantastic, which is what I call sticky bits companies. So what are those? Those are marketplaces, those are network effects, and specifically in enterprise, those are top-down system of record sales companies, okay? So what are examples of those? Facebook is an obvious one, Snapchat is one, Slack is another one. Um, and those are really, really interesting kinds of businesses. Why? Because they're very hard to disrupt once they get going. There's an inherent flywheel and momentum that creates a usability mode or an acquisition mode or some kind of a mode that you can't necessarily just overcome with capital. And then, quite honestly, there's everything in the middle, which is everything else. And what you realize is that's a lot of companies. And you know, some of our enterprise companies fall into that category and I hadn't realized it. I thought that they were fantastic because their revenue traction was like this. And I thought, my gosh, this is great. A million of ARR, three million of ARR, five million of ARR. 
How does that change the strategy when you're doing a portfolio review and how do you communicate that to, how do you communicate that to the founders? I'll get to that in one second. Okay. So you hit a wall. And I think the reason is because those companies benefit from the fact that you can sell software with a credit card, right? But it was naive for us to think that all of a sudden somebody else could come in behind us with the same strategy to disrupt us. So before you had 10, 15 years to build a business. Now you have four or five years to build a business. It's not enough time. And you have to load your business up with sales and marketing and HR and PR and product marketing and customer success. All this infrastructure that is secondary to what you really have to do, which is fundamental for product marketing. Thing. Those businesses, I think, are in real trouble. And the reason why that's in real trouble is, again, I think is somewhat related to what's going to happen over the next five or six years. This administration has made clear, which I think is a fantastic thing, they're going to pump trillions of dollars into the economy. Trillions of dollars. Literally, you can see it. Infrastructure spending, massive capital projects, that is going to be a renaissance of, I think, middle income job growth. But what it's also going to do is going to inflate equities to a degree we probably haven't seen in a while. And so if you can get 15, 16, 17% IRRs in the public markets, why would you ever put your money into 10-year illiquid venture capital for the same IRR? It doesn't make sense. And so I think what actually happens is the following. Bits to Adams companies thrive because there's a manufacturing, a US first message that works. Sticky bits companies because they're capital light, highly sticky. The businesses in the middle must get very precise very quick because those companies will need to go and raise capital. But they will be faced with the following capital dynamic, which is that the public markets, if we have as much public market exposure as we do privates, and I struggle every day now to think about how I deploy an incremental dollar into privates for the same effective return when I should really just putting it in the publics because I know the publics are gonna rip. Because when President-elect Trump pours $2 trillion of money into the public markets, I'm telling you, the Dow is gonna go like this, the S&P 500 is gonna go like this, and it's liquid. So those dynamics, I think, need to be understood. And we typically don't even think about that. We don't typically think about what does Washington do or what could New York do to affect us, but that is what it's gonna do. It is gonna change the capital cycle because it's gonna change the risk reward. The last seven years have been that money is free, the public markets gyrate sideways, plus or minus, and the only return, perceived return, has been in private illiquid investing. The public markets are quickly catching up. Debt is gonna catch up, because we're gonna see interest rates rise. All of these things have an effect in the real rate of return you can generate in our asset class, which by the way, is not going up. It's actually flat to going down. And the reason is because for the last eight years, we've got all this money flooded in, and what used to be a $5 million A is now a $10 million A. What do you think happens with that? It's not as if the outcomes are also doubling. The outcomes stay the same, the prices go up, which means the return shrinks. So these dynamics, I think, are now going to come to the fore, and the next four to five years is how all of this stuff plays out. That's a very long winded answer, but that's why I think that's what I think Trump needs to talk about. It is a wake up call, a sobriety check on rational company building, thoughtful business model construction, strategic operational guidance of the business, and that is in short supply. Hmm. So, I mean, that's a very interesting take. It, it, this topic isn't going to be as interesting, but I was curious from your experience at Facebook and then all the resultant sort of, I guess you can call controversy around Facebook and filter bubbles and fake news. What's your point of view on that controversy and so, is there anything Facebook should do? So I don't wanna talk about Facebook, but I will talk generally about social media. Sure. I owe everything to Facebook. I'm loyal to those guys, let's just call us Facebook. Yeah. They have a difficult job, almost an impossible job. But let's take a step back and not talk about it. Let, let, let's make, let's it, about, let's let's make it feeds, well, so Twitter, Reddit. Well, let's actually talk about social media in general. Sure. Um, it is fair to say, and I think you can almost, you can actually put Google in this category as well. Social media or user-generated content is modern feudalism, okay? So let's call it that. You have 
1.8 billion internet-connected individuals all around the world that are fastidiously doing the work, doing the hard work for companies that now are you know, tens of thousands of employees deep, not much more, to then monetize and then share that within themselves. Okay, so for example, let's look at Google. That's a $517 billion market cap company. The core escape velocity was PageRank. But how did PageRank work? PageRank didn't work because Google all of a sudden judged the quality of the search index. You did that work. And Google was just able to harvest that signal. Right? So you did the work, they built the 517 million businesses. Most social media UGC companies, you upload the content, you annotate it, you create great, brilliant experiences, you don't get paid. The company that owns it gets paid. So the first thing we have to acknowledge is that there is a compact that has existed for a while that we probably didn't anticipate. And in that compact were some expectations. And now it's all coming home to roost. There was theoretically an expectation that us as a consumer was owed some amount of truthiness, quality, and SLA. And that was never in the SLA. That was never in the compact. The compact was you're going to do the work and we're going to make the money. And that happened. All the incentive systems. And this is not in a company specific thing. This is an entire industry classification thing. That is just the truth of what happened. So when we look at what's happening now, I think what we have to realize is those companies are in the job of making money. So when you look at how products are constructed, so now let's talk about feeds in general. And let's compare it to newspapers. So let's take media of the past, newspapers or television. They were time bounded or physical space bounded, right? So in the case of television, you had a 30 minute window. A show started, a show ended, there were blocks of time that were sellable, there was a message, but it has to get truncated in a fixed period of time. Let's take a newspaper. You sat down, you opened the paper on page one, and it would end on page 10. So my point is there was scarcity in old media. And so you had to now actually have an SLA around the quality of the content because it had a direct correlation to engagement, which then had a direct correlation to monetization. We divorced ourselves from that expectation in new media because the first thing we did was we eliminated scarcity. Right? There's a reason why feeds are infinite scroll guys. There's a reason you can't get to the end of YouTube. Right? And the reason is because it's directly correlated with modernization, right? There is one single economic formula that guides all of social media, which is clicks times ECPC. That's it. And so I think we just need to be really intellectually honest about what that compact is. We should have never been expecting truthiness. But if you do want truthiness, now I think is the time to demand it but then the question is, what are you willing to do if you don't get it? And that's also a very other, that's a really difficult question that I don't think we also don't know how to answer right now. So I think social media in general has been constructed in a model that was purely about feudalistic modernization and capitalism. This modern form of something or other that is just the fantastical business model of all times. Right? If you add up the entire market cap of all UGC companies, a trillion, two trillion dollars, right, globally, how many total employees? Less than 300,000, 400,000? I mean, that's preposterous. Two billion people generating two trillion value shared by 200,000, 300,000. Do you think anything changes in either how any of the companies uh, present content or how users behave, or this will just sort of... So this is what I'm saying. So now I think we have, to, we have to now shift and say, let's have a more first principles conversation about what we now know is actually happening. There is a monetization formula that dominates. And we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to com compromise usability and quality of the product as it is today in order to get some of these other things? So as an example, there's a person that I think, for me, I follow a lot because he gives me the most truthiness of my network, which is Joe Lonsdale. Joe Lonsdale to me is like my sort of like keystone of truthiness. That guy finds unbelievably clear, clean, thoughtful content. And he shares it both on Facebook and on Twitter. And so 
Does it change the usability of my product because I now don't look at my feed as much? I instead actually just search for Lonzo, see what he's posted, and read that stuff? I do that. Does it mean I miss a bunch of stuff? Yes. Does it make me more detached from the people around me because they're like, hey, did you see my uh, uh, you know, great, awesome uh, cat dressed as Luke Skywalker for Halloween? And I'm like, no, motherfucker, I could care less about your cat. Uh, I was reading about, you know, uh, whatever like Slate Star Codex had to say because Joe Lonzo thought it was important and I trust Joe Lonzo's vote. So I have changed my mental expectation of what these channels should give me. It makes me less superficially connected to the people around me. It makes me more introspective and thoughtful about my worldview. That's not necessarily a fantastic formula for friendship. So how many people are willing to make that trade-off? Are you going to make that trade-off? Do you expect the services you use to make that trade-off for you? That's a very slippery slope. So I have no clear-cut answers. Um, but I do think another solution to this is that there needs to be some of these products or sites, both offline or online, that need to be more operated as a public trust. And I think the most simple way to get back to a model of scarcity and content value that relies on an SLA is to basically remove this primary driver, which is ECPC times um, number of impressions. Which means, if it was funded to not have to make money, now it could theoretically, theoretically, at least focus on not generating clicks and views, but theoretically relaying content. And there should be sources like that. ProPublica maybe is one of those things. Slate Star Codex actually is quite good. Um, and there's, there's a bunch of these things, but they're hard to find. And they're really super long tail. And there's no efficient way to share it once you do find it. So now, now to get even in a more insular topic, uh, I spent a couple days in New York after the election and I talked to a lot of old friends and folks in the industry, and they're all reading the New York Times and, and they all seem very, very shocked. And so I started to think about, well, even in, in Silicon Valley or media, there is an echo chamber. It might be on Twitter, it might be in, in the various blogs. Is there something that analogous to what happened um, on the coasts, for example, in early November, to what may happen in terms of the technology media landscape. Are, is our information filtered to a point where we don't see what's happening? Yeah, of course. <laughs> oh, our heads are so far up our own asses, it's like... <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's not good, but it's the truth. I mean, for example, let's go back to how I started. There are three kinds of companies, right? Bits to Adams company. Sticky bits companies and everything else. And if you actually go back and like, if we tried to run a classifier on the last eight years and last quarter of a trillion dollars of invested capital, what do we think we'd find, quite honestly? We'd find very few of those bucket one and bucket two companies. We'd find a tremendous amount of things in this bucket three company. And part of what that speaks to is the fact that when things are easy, we pursue them because there's a fast feedback. And part of what, why that's happened is because we love fast feedback. It's no longer okay to win in 10 or 15 years. For most people now, in this perverse way, that seems like the end of life as we know it. The idea that one could work for 15 years on something is crazy. How could that be? It has to happen in three years. And instead I think to myself, doesn't it seem plausible that if you can build $5 billion of value in two years? Value, okay. They could also just get destroyed in the same in the next two years? Doesn't that stand to reason? If it was that easy for you, wouldn't it be that easy for somebody else to come in behind you? Of course. And so the thing is, like we've we've gotten trapped in this culture, this iterative feedback loop of now, 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 now. And so this is a fantastic moment in time where we can actually say, man, we have to divorce ourselves from this stuff. The world needs us to help do things that are hard. But too much of our time gets unfortunately like redirected into the things that are easy and obvious. And the reason is because there's an entire infrastructure of people that want to basically congratulate you and reward you 
for short-term fake progress. And none of it is sustainable ultimately. And especially when there is a capital cycle. Most entrepreneurs right now, like just a volume, have, didn't even go through 2007, 8, 9, let alone 2000, 2001, 2. I've, I've been through both of those cycles. And I'm telling you, like, I don't think we really appreciate what it's going to take to survive when the risk premium in venture doesn't justify the capital. And I'm telling you guys, we're headed in that direction. Just as a kind of quick counterpoint to that, I've heard from maybe the last three years really smart market observers and investors saying the capital is starting to dry up, dry up. And you do feel it in certain follow-on rounds, but it seems like at the same time, there's more and more money coming in. And so if that continues to happen, does that mean that what you're predicting maybe will take longer to play? No, no, this is like, look, I, I think like you have probably two years of market highs in the US equities. But you know, things are lagging, right? All like money is always a lagging indicator. Like with respect to revenue, it's always a lagging indicator of value, and inflows are always a lagging indicator of, of risk allocation. And the thing is like you're gonna look back and in these next 18 months, you know. It may be the case that that $100 billion fund that SoftBank was able to cobble together is the top. And you don't know in the moment. You only know in hindsight. And so all I'm saying is this is not meant to depress you. It's meant to clarify what you're doing. And the problem is twofold. One is the courage and the instincts to do things that may not necessarily go like this. But my gosh, I'm telling you, if you can compound 20% a year for 20 years, I'd take that 100 times out of 100 than this little thing. Okay, because this thing, honestly, as fast as it works, it can disappear. The other thing, though, is that then you need to find sources of capital who also understand that. And at least what I'm trying to vocalize to you is that there are some places out there, people who realize that working on hard things is better than working on easy things. And working on things that are sticky, that are not obvious, that may take years and years, may be okay. Because once they get going, they'll get going forever. And oh, by the way, the ability for you to actually feel like you have the social capital to work on something for 15 years and it be okay is actually okay. And if you not live, like the filter bubble you need to break is the one in San Francisco, which is like, oh, everything happens in three to four years. Do you think that there's more, uh, more and by, I'm sorry, and by the way, if you're not clear, look at like the last group of people you recruited and go and ask them how long they were there in the last few jobs. <laughs> I think it's two to four years fast. Real quick, if you have questions, just line up here. And the reason she does we condition people to yeah. think about this as like, oh, everything has to happen in two to four years, otherwise I'm out. Then I'm gonna go to the next company. Then I'm gonna go to the next company. And this kind of mercenary approach to either being a founder or raising capital or being an employee is destructive, A. But it also is a path for us to be completely out of touch with what really needs to happen. There's a reason why SpaceX is going to be a hundred billion dollar company. But guys, it's taken them 14 years. I mean, because it's hard. Do you think that is a local mindset that gives an opportunity to other locations? Is that is that specific to this area? It's a decision. It is a decision. It's a decision to listen to, you know, what Gurley has said a lot, who, I mean, he and I are quite aligned on this generally. What I'm maybe saying now, for whatever it's a value, is to make hard decisions and then take the time to find the sources of capital that agree with you. And I think that really matters. And then separately, that's at, the, that's at this high level. But then practically speaking, to use metrics, to use data, to use things like our magic eight ball to just show you the way. And then to be thoughtful about experimenting. Here's an experiment that we're currently running. You know, what I, what I, as a pre, as a, as an outcome of this view, what I said to the team is, can you please go and figure out how we could maybe abstract all the sales and marketing from all of our mid-tier SaaS companies and we will stand up a company and embed it into our growth team? And initially I get the same feedback. It's not possible. Only I can sell my thing. And I'm like, really? I mean, like, this seems to me Salesforce is selling 90 things better today than they did 10 years ago when they were selling one thing. 
IBM sells 150 things. Microsoft sells 9,000 things. And they just seem to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you are fucking bullshit. And so what if we could actually just take all of the sales motions and generalize them and abstract them so that now a company can be even more leveraged and focused on their go to market? And now we can have best in class people and we can actually staff those people all over the country. They can be in Ohio, they can be in Michigan, they can be in the Central Valley. You can't staff a sales organization here, guys. 200,000 fully loaded OTE for a startup trying to sell a product for a few thousand dollar ACV, that dog doesn't hunt. Okay? You don't need to be a magician of Excel to figure that out. So these are like basic unit economic level discussions that are not happening in enough scale. And so what happens? You get some ARR growth, and you raise more money, and then you unprofitably acquire more customers, generate more ARR growth, raise more money. That's not sustainable. So I think the thing we have to realize is like there has to be different, more creative, thoughtful ways of company building. There needs to be more practical, quantitative insights. And you have to break this relationship with this theoretical, romanticized notion of how success works in terms of time, it doesn't take four years. It may take eight, and it probably takes 12. So buckle in. Capital. Doing more with less is always the better way. Sobriety around all of the things that matter versus the things that don't. I mean, this is the last time we talked about, you know, kind cars and scrolls big walls don't matter. They will not be correlated to your success. And then working on hard things. Because the fast feedback loop, while it feels good and there's a dopamine rush initially, you must internalize that it creates equal and offsetting risk that somebody else can compete with you to do the same thing, but their motivation will be to do it cheaper, faster, and better, because that was your motivation to be the incumbent that first allowed you to get that momentum in the first place. Right? Great, so we, we're gonna um, take some questions if you have a question, just step up to one of the mics, introduce yourself, and a brief question, please. Hi, John. Uh, Victor from Gearback Coach. So you talked a lot about working on hard problems and then Trump as well. I'm just curious what your views are on healthcare, given all that's happening. Um, there's been a couple of things that have been really negative tailwinds. Sorry, negative. There were, there were some massive tailwinds in healthcare that have now become massive headwinds. And I'll explain a couple of them. One is at a state level, and one is at a federal level. So at the state level, there were a lot of businesses that theoretically could have existed, but we've had California enact two things that are actually constructively quite negative. And I'm not here to debate whether you agree with them or not, I'm just kind of relating some facts. Number one is around licensure of certain parties and business models that are on the periphery of healthcare. Um, not the hospitals themselves, but whether it's a school nursing facility, whether it's like the at-home care, there's a whole bunch of downstream things that are involved in the healthcare life cycle and keeping people well that are now more regulated than they were. Secondly, there's been also some very specific rules around compensation, minimum wage increases, and the way that you account for overtime and overtime payment. What that's done, unfortunately, as a practical matter in California, is there's a bunch of healthcare businesses that frankly now cannot exist. Um, and as a result, what's happened is a bunch of black market activity on Texas. Second is, I think the, I think not knowing what the president is gonna do around Obamacare and the ACA has slowed down and paused Medicare and CMS. Um, things that are related to it, whether there are insurance kinds of businesses, whether there are reimbursement you know, um, related businesses, I think are also now in deep, deep trouble. Now, let's talk about some tailwinds. But there are still some structural tailwinds that exist, number one, Theoretically, people are actually going to have more money in their pocket. There's a direct correlation with chronic disease and people having more money. So whether we, obviously we don't like this, but the reality is as we have more money through the tax cuts and everything else, diabetes will go up, cancer will go up, asthma will go up, obesity will go up. So those diseases will still unfortunately continue to compound. It's deleterious effects on society. Number two, there are just these massive personnel shortages that exist within the healthcare ecosystem that are not well serviced today. Nursing being probably the most important. So that's my kind of like short-term view is that we're quite 
um, nervous uh, about what the impacts to reversing some of the Obamacare policies are, but the good news is we actually have very little exposure to the Medicare, Medicaid type related businesses, and we still are in businesses that have some reasonably good tailwinds, particularly around chronic disease, that we still think has tremendous value, no matter what. I uh, love your insights, you can be super fired up as an entrepreneur, so appreciate it. Um, so I'm a CEO of a company, and we have raised, we just raised a round of capital, and one of the things that helped us close is we really communicated to our investors that we want to build a sustainable business. We should go cash flow positive this summer. We're not trying to shoot, shoot for a Series A or shoot for these crazy valuations. Are you seeing companies here in the Valley just only chase the valuations versus companies outside in markets that kind of get less attention? Yeah, I mean, I think that what's happening is that there has been this culture where people, like, look, you know how they say there's this, what is this phrase, like, uh, history is written by the winners? But the, the, the real thing is, like, there's a narrative fallacy, which is bullshit version of history is written by the winners. And the thing is, if you're going to write a story in hindsight, obviously you're going to project yourself as, like, this strapping, muscular winner, Good looking, I can dance, I can dunk, I did everything right, right? You romanticize it, you bullshit that. The problem is the N plus first person that hears it thinks, oh my gosh, they must be telling the truth. And so the, the, the effect of all of this is that you have had people chasing valuation because they think, oh, valuation means something. It means nothing. You know, there's a fantastic investor who, who, who told me, which I love, he's like, well, how did you ever want your company value at billions of dollars ever? He's like, I want to value at zero until the last possible moment before we get it. And he's right. Why? Your employees make more money. You make more money. You take less pollution. You're more sober in your application. All of those things are good things. So to your point, yes, I do think we've kind of been chasing these wrong vanity metrics. You know, we used to chase registered users, and then we realized it was now, then we realized it was down now. We've been chasing valuation and we chase the post and we think it means something. Guys, there's been less liquidity in the last five years than ever. None of these valuations mean a goddamn thing. They mean nothing. And we take them so seriously and we pat ourselves on the back and we think something real is happening. It's the blind leading the blind until these things get out. And the way to get out is to get profitable. There is no way to get out. So yeah, get to profit early. That's just awesome. I wish you the best of luck. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Sure. okay, so it seems that what you're attacking or being contrarian about is in fact all the people in this room and start an ecosystem that is attempting to scale entrepreneurism. And the thing about pursuing things that are hard is that that many less people are going to be able to do that. That most of these ideas are these little schmatty, stupid ideas, and Y Combinator loves that shit. You know, well, wait a minute, hold on. I, I think that that's unfair. And I'll say this, like, so I saw Sam yesterday. That's not true. Like, those guys, like, for example, like, this space printing company was out of YC. Like, the reason we're involved and the reason why he actually will tell you, he had to create a separate path for those companies because it is so hard for them to get any attention. And it just, it, it, all I'm saying is, it takes a different capital cycle. And what I'm telling you is there are actually more profits in those hard businesses than in these businesses. And so what we need is actually a reframing of how we think about value. And if you did that, there is, it doesn't take $100 million to print this robotic arm business. This 3D printing business we're in is, was a $7 million check. It's no different than any enterprise Series A company. You know, we just did this fleet of autonomous drones in Alameda. Those drones that are in the water circumnavigating all the oceans, measuring fish stocks, oil spills, climate change, was an $8 million A. My point is, their go-to-markets are different. The way they construct the business is different, and it takes a different kind of investing lens, and I think it is possible to have. And we just have to create incentives that celebrate those people, so that, to use your language, it's not just the schmatzy stuff that we pump up and we say is what, because the person far away that's not here, when, when TechCrunch gives 50,000 paid views to the schmatz, and one page into the drone company, guess what you're gonna have? More schmatz. And that same person can probably build the next fleet of drones or cure cancer. And there are capital sources that can fund it. I got a, we have a lot of money that we can deploy a hardship. Hi, Chris. 
I, I guess the point being that the hard stuff, what you're talking about, what's the heat? All right. Typically, might need expertise and experience, and I don't have to tell you that people who are over 35 probably can't even get in the front door. That there's yeah, that's so stupid too. Totally, do that. I totally agree with you. Look, my listen. My whole thing is for every person that drops out, which is fine and good. There is so much value in working at a company. I worked at AOL. I worked at Facebook before I started my startup. And I felt way more prepared. I was a 36-year-old founder CEO. I'm glad I waited until I was 36. I had so much more knowledge because I learned beside people. I learned from people that were better than me. I also learned from people that were not as good as me about all the things that I shouldn't be doing. So to your point, I agree with you. This is what I'm saying. We need to divorce ourselves from this romanticized narrative like fallacy that we've created, that it's this Two dudes, 22 years old, dropped out of school, coded some schmatzy thing. That's not what success is about necessarily. There are some great examples of that where they're creating real value, but there's all of these other things. There's 40-year-olds, there's 50-year-olds, there's 35-year-olds, there's men and women, there's people doing all kinds of things that are not easy. And we have to find a way of like telling the world that this also exists and this stuff is worthwhile because I suspect that the long-term solution for us being less tone deaf, and for us actually being a constructive part of solutions, is to celebrate these people. Right, and so my own life, my own experience has been that software, the purpose of software is to actually change the world. And if you can make some money along the way, great. Unfortunately, in this world, you're only as good as your last IPO and how much money you made. A lot more money was made off of my company than I made. A lot of people made a lot of money, but in fact, we wouldn't have multimedia if I hadn't started that company. So, so at the end of the day, software is, a, you know, it, it shouldn't be about waking up in the morning time, how much money can I make? It should be these hard issues that I'm trying to solve. And yeah, I'll make some money along the way. That's kind of been my philosophy. That's a fair point. I think it's a really good point. Absolutely. Last question here. Hey, Monica. Hi. Guys, Ben, yeah, Airspace Systems. Um, so we talk about solving hard problems, hardware, software, High speed physics and just drums at very high speed. Things that happens. Yeah, you got it. And so one of our challenges is it's it's all about talent, right? Like my number one job is just to get to the best of the best talent we can get on board. Having a lot of challenges in that because you're fighting the Teslas of the world, the Facebooks of the world, the Googles of the world, and we're going to Canada. We're getting a lot of great talent from Waterloo. You've been talking about it. And so the problem is that we're worried about the immigration. A lot of these engineers and professors that we're grabbing from Canada are worried about this new administration, all the talk about yanking green cards and things like that, and what are you hearing about startup visas and... To be honest, I, I really don't know. Um, I haven't heard anything yet. Um, look, I think, I think what's fair to say is I think that there's a, there's a view of American exceptionalism, which I think is actually quite constructive, and at the end of the day, it seems, I could be wrong, that Donald Trump is quite pragmatic and wants to win. And I'll just use a sports analogy. Like, we want to talk about <laughs> Like, when sports teams win, it's when they recruit the best. And what's amazing is like, you get these people in, they come from all different backgrounds, and you get them organized, you get them running on the same strategy, and they win championships. And then if they're really good, they win multiple championships. And at some very basic level, what America has the ability to do, unlike any other country in the world, is to literally cherry pick the best of the best. And I think that'll be a decision that the government will probably make constructively because I think if you take American exceptionalism to the extreme, why wouldn't we want to do this? And if that includes people who want to legitimately be here, contribute their intellectual capital, monetary capital, we should we should find a mechanism and a way to do that. Um, so I suspect that he's quite pragmatic. Thank you. Well, as predicted, that was great. So thank you very much, Ma. Thanks for everyone for, for watching. And We'll do it again soon. Huh?